This week's episode is sponsored by May Botanicals, small batch botanical skincare that is responsibly grown, harvested, and handcrafted by Dr. Carrie Logan. May Botanicals offers plant-infused facial oil, sugar scrub, and body butter, as well as a limited quantity of summer-specific boxes to help you care for your skin, connect with the element of fire, and build meaningful rituals. Call on the magic of summer. Pre-order your seasonal box today at maybotanicals.com or on Instagram at maybotanicals. That's M-A-E botanicals.com. Welcome to Moonbeaming, a podcast about magic, creativity, the tarot, lunar living, and more. I'm your host, Sarah Faith Godestiner, and I'm so happy you're here. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Moonbeaming, a podcast for skeptics, mystics, magicians, witches, critical thinkers, artists, creatives, philosophers, and just human beings, you know? So welcome. I'm your host, Sarah Faith Godestiner, and I could not be more thrilled to be here with you now. I cannot believe it is June 2021. And on that tip, it's time to announce our review winner for the podcast's giveaway. Every month, every single person who has left a five-star review telling us why you love this show is entered into a giveaway. And drum roll, please. This week's winner is Megan at Something Effulgent. Megan writes, I'm always amazed and affirmed at how Sarah's observations truly reflect the energies at play, not just in the broader world, but often really specifically in my personal life. Not only are her psychic abilities truly no joke, she also delivers her wisdom in a way that I find so consistently grounding and soothing. I've learned so much. Thank you. Thank you, Megan. That is the sweetest little note. You know, once in a while, once in a great while, being a psychic is good for something. <laughs> Not much. And I'll do, I'm doing another episode on that, but uh, once in a while, it's good for something. So thank you, Megan. You win a 25 minute reading with me. Please contact us so we can schedule that. And to all of you who've left five star reviews, thank you. Thank you so much. I'm so grateful. Every month you will be re entered in the giveaway and just know that I am sending you so much gratitude around your sweet notes. I love them. Another bit of news I am excited to announce is about a brand new workshop I just released. She's brand spanking new. She is fresh. She is fresh out of that cosmic oven. This is a workshop about money. And it is called Money Alchemy, Transform Your Worth. And you know, the title is absolutely literal. It is totally about money. It is totally about transformation. It is about changing our relationships to money, to our worth, to our beliefs, our patterns. And I could not be more excited. I've wanted to teach on money and transformation and magic so much more than I actually have. And so I finally found some time to put together a comprehensive workshop that is a real solid starting point around thinking about three common money imprints, three ways to shift into an abundance mindset, as well as, of course, some magical, mystical perspectives and support. I bring in the elements as well as the minor suits of the tarot to help you start to ask questions so that you can make shifts in your relationship with money 
babes, I know you know this. I've said this before. I want all of us brilliant, talented, creative, magical folks to be resourced, resourced in all the ways, and that includes financially. And in my own process of going from minimum wage worker to a business owner who generates profits in the six figures, I had to shift my relationship and my actions around money. I had to do it. There was no other way. So my learnings and my thoughts on this are what I'm presenting in this workshop. In addition to my talk, which is about an hour and a half of so, so much information, you also receive a meditation and worksheets designed to further support you in your own process. You know, I'm not sure another workshop like this exists. It's totally pulled from my own reflections and experiences and my own process around money. And I am delighted to share what I know with you. And so if you want to learn more about it and buy it, you can check it out on our website, modernwomenprojects.com. The link will also be in the show notes. Okay, I am thrilled about this week's guest. I know I say it every time. That's because every time I have the honor to share time and space with some really brilliant folks. This week's guest is Toy Smith. Toy is a mother, a writer, a teacher, a business owner, and a strategist. Her work centers on doing life differently doing business differently, and doing motherhood differently. She works with people whose work is countercultural, liberatory, and revolutionary in nature, or people who desire and are committed to moving their work or lives in that direction. I am so inspired by Toy's writing and her mind. She's absolutely brilliant. I highly suggest you follow her on Instagram take her classes, and really take the time to reflect upon her messages, her knowledge, and her shares. In this episode, we talk about Toy's spiritual practice, how motherhood got her to question everything, how she is doing business differently, and of course, we had to talk some trash on capitalism. Yes, we did. This conversation is for folks who are questioning maybe everything, but definitely stuff around how they work and why they work, which probably is everybody. This is for folks who want to do things differently or who are doing things differently and want to feel less alone. This episode is definitely for people who want to put their values, their beliefs into action. Um, After our interview, we also do a love reading for Toy. So stay tuned to see what is in the cards for her and also to see what kinds of cards come up that absolutely affirm L-O-B-E, all caps, maybe like three or four exclamation marks on the end because I literally got chills when these cards turned up for her in this love reading. Okay, so let's dive into this week's interview after a brief word from this week's sponsor. This episode is brought to you by Haradin Vodka. Haradin is a brand new craft vodka, and there are so many things to like about it. It's gluten-free, it's made from local organic corn, and it comes in a -a one-of-a-kind hand-blown bottle. And I love it, babes. There's this beautiful illustration of the moon on it. So, you know, you know that I love that. And what I especially really love about it is that they are a small women founded company. I've met them. They're really lovely. 
and their intent on defying the restrictive norms of the liquor industry and also the culture itself. And that's why they named the brand Harridan. It means bossy, belligerent old woman. I love it. I love that so much. And I really do recommend checking them out if you're looking for high quality spirits brand that you can feel good about buying from. I've tried it. It's delicious. They What I love about them is they literally know the names of the farmers that are like making the corn and the suppliers that they work with by their first name. They really did their due diligence with their company. Paradin is currently available in store in New York and it's online nationwide on their website, Harridan.com. I'll put the link in the show notes and to stay updated on when they're coming to you and your state. You can also follow them on Instagram at Harridan Vodka, all one word, Harridan Vodka. Hello, hello, and welcome to Moonbeaming. I could not be more thrilled to introduce everyone to this week's guest. This person is a thought leader. This is someone I have admired and looked up to. They are a brilliant writer. They have such a huge heart. Their business and how they present themselves to the world is totally authentic and also multifaceted which is something I really, really admire in people. Um, So I am more than thrilled to introduce all of you to Toy. Toy, hello. Say hello. 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 Thank you for having me, Sarah. I'm so excited to talk. Um, So can you just introduce, like, in your own words, who are you? What do you do? What do you like? Um, My name is Toy Smith. Um, My formal title on the Internet streets is Growth and Impact Strategist. What that essentially means is I help people to grow, to shed um, inside their businesses, which also means inside of their personal life as well, usually because there are solopreneurs. Um, I'm a strategist, meaning that I help people carve a way forward, uh, usually in countercultural ways inside of their business. So uh, my work is multifaceted, multilayered. Um, And I work with a lot of people who are really pressing against norms and trying to do things differently. I love that. So I'll just start with asking you, do you consider yourself spiritual? I do. Yes. Um, My family is from New Orleans. I am first generation born here in Denver, Colorado, but my lineage goes all the way back uh, for generation, generation, generations to New Orleans. So I have heavy roots in spirituality. I grew up in a Catholic household. My grandparents were um, Catholic. My mom (laughs) went to Catholic high school. And then when she got older, she was like, I'm done with all religion and all spirituality. So she is, believes in a, in a God, but isn't heavily a religious or spiritual. I am more spiritual. I pull cards. I have candles. I have a couple altars. Um, I read all of the spiritual texts and, um, Yeah. So it's a big part of my world. How has it helped or shaped or transformed you? (sighs) Um, I will say that I've always been really spiritual um, and kind of searching for a deeper why. When I was in um, like when I was in, I remember being in middle school and no one wanted to go to like church or like understand religion. Or I found a friend and I was like, can I go with you? I'm just trying to understand what's going on. And so throughout my life, as I've uncovered more and searched more, I've kind of landed on um, this spot of knowing there is something bigger and better out into the universe um, and that we're all here for a reason. Um, And so it guides me in making sure my work follows that in all of the ways that it can. What was the last spiritual experience you had? A couple years ago when my grandmother passed away, I had a really profound experience in her in her house that I grew up in. My, grand, um, my grandfather and my grandmother, I grew up living with them. And I didn't want to let this house go. Everyone else in my family 
you know, can't maintain it and we couldn't um, keep it in the house, in the family. And I want it to keep it so bad because it's like a pillar. It's like the place where people would go. And I was at the house as they were cleaning it out. And I just was in their room and I found a book. Um, it's a set. It's a Bible that's all like torn up, like it's been used, used, used. That was my grandfather's in his drawer. And he had passed away 14 years earlier. Mm -hmm. And this Bible was still in there. And it had these little books that were like uh, little devotional books that he Mm -hmm. probably read that were back from the 60s that were telling him to like keep going and things like that. And I was like, this is amazing. And for me, that connection to be able to find that like relic and have that Mm -hmm. for me. And then it brought me at like to ease to feel like they're still with me. And I have this thing that means so much because who knows who it belonged to, um, but that it was there in their room. Uh, that was probably the last, like one of the biggest moments for me. Mm, yeah, that sounds really special, especially because you still have, uh, you have an object that they poured all their energy and their mm-hmm. prayer and their beliefs into, it feels yeah. really special. Um, for me, uh, spirituality has served a similar function in some ways as mm-hmm. sociology or like learning more about systems of oppression mm-hmm. or feminism and things like that, because like learning about these intersecting systems that shape our behaviors, our dreams, our trauma, like our everyday life, all of these things, it kind of like both spirituality and sort of learning about history, uh, they, they pulled the veil back for me in a way that helps me to recognize what's most important, uh, and to recognize my own context, you know, and in a much sort of larger system. And I'm also wondering, like, if you have a kind of similar experience between the two, or maybe I, maybe I want to ask you what has sort of pulled the veil back, so to speak, uh, and, and helped you gain clarity, uh, you know, in, in the most recent years or in your life? I think for me, what has given me the most clarity or made me question so many things and then look for those answers has been being a mother. Um, I have four boys um, and I have four boys by three different men. And so I always say this because it's important. It has been the thing that has catapulted me into trying to understand why we exist the way we do. And like, especially for mothers, especially for black single mothers. And of course, when you're unraveling those intersections, you start to understand everything's connected and you start to look at all of the other things. And so that's probably been the biggest thing for me that has led me to down this, this path of like, wanting to pull the veil back on how we do and how we be and how we live. Um, And then of course that you start to like scrutinize and look at everything you kind of been taught as you've grown up. Right. So that probably would be the big thing. Was it like being a mother and being conscious of your behaviors or interactions with you and your kids made you start to be like, why do I do this? Or where does this come from? Is that what you mean? Yeah, it was it was like, why for me, because I'm a single mom. And so like the youngest, my I have a set of twins and then I have my youngest son who is nine. And so I parent them alone. And so when I started to pull back and I also was raised by a single mother. So then when I started to pull back these layers of like, well, why do men get to leave and why do women stay and why are men like there's no accountability really for men, but there is for women, even if they are parenting. the. So I started to really look at that stuff. And then I'm like, okay, so then that impacts me being able to go to work. And then I'm already not making enough. So then I started like pulling back that layer as well. Um, And then when my kids were in school, like, you know, having to be a single mom going to the school and like explain things and be the mom and be the dad. So And it's a reason why I became an entrepreneur, honestly, because of what happens um, in in the corporate world. 
Yeah. So I want that's This is a great segue because one of the questions I had for you is I know you worked for corporations, for companies, and then you began to work for yourself. And so is that, was that the shift? Like, I'd love for you to share a little bit of the process from be, from going from an employee mm-hmm. to a business owner. Mm-hmm. I've all, I have to first say, I've always been kind of like an entrepreneur at heart, like some side hustle, trying to figure out something. And it was mainly a way to be creative for me. Um, I always felt in like corporate jobs, I was like stifled that like, I couldn't be creative. Um, so I've always just had something from like selling Mary Kay to Avon to like, just something I'm, I'm that person or like small business ideas. So what happened for me is I was laid off two times in a row. Um, and after the second time that I was laid off, I was like, yeah, I'm not, I'm just not going to do that again. Now I had already had, I have some friends who were entrepreneurs who were coaches, artists. And, um, so I just took the unemployment and then was like, I'm just going to chill and like think for a bit and see like what I can do. And so then friends would give me like little odd jobs. Like, can you, you know, do these docs? Can you edit this? Can you, you know, and so I started doing that. It wasn't paying the bills, but it was something for me to understand, like what it took to manage my time in that way and to um, be in collaboration and communication with someone. And then I was in a Facebook group uh, for someone, her name is Kelly Deals, and she was looking, she was hiring. She was like, I need to hire someone. I think it was like 10 hours a week. And I was like, oh, I can do that. It was just a VA position. And so I emailed her and said, I just sent, no, I sent her a message on Facebook. And I said, I just emailed you my resume. I can do that job with my hands tied behind my back. So like, and so then we got on the phone the next day on Zoom and then she hired me and kind of that's how it got started. I did really great work for her. And then her platform was kind of growing in her work. And then she started like shouting me out. And then I am like a writer. So I just would start writing about certain things and I started getting more clients. And so that's what led me into this, this intersection of working for myself. What does your business look like or consist of now? Well, now, so it's been through so many iterations. I've been working for myself for about six years. I started out as a VA. Then I moved into an OBM. And then from there, I went into like a strategist. And now it is a mixture of things. So I mainly work in the capacity people hire me in like thought partnership and in strategy. If they are trying to move their business into anti-capitalist, anti-oppressive ways, then that's kind of what they hire me for to like have those conversations and to look at the nuance of like who you're hiring and how you're hiring and what your marketing is and things like that. Um, And then I also have a business group that is called business for the people. And we are all kind of processing those same kind of things of like, how do we do that in our own respective businesses? And then I also just recently started doing workshops around motherhood and writing and um, exploring motherhood for those who parent. And so it's a mixture of things right now. (laughs) Yeah. 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 I mean, it keeps, it keeps us on our toes and also a little bit stressed, but I I understand it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, So what has running a business taught you about yourself? Oh my gosh. So much. I say that working for yourself is one of the biggest self-development like projects in the world. (laughs) Like, it's so next level that like, you don't think things are going to come up in business because you're like, that's business stuff. And because we've been trained to separate business and personal so much that we don't think that like these collaborations and these relationships are real deal. Right. So it has really shown me that I have to really love the people I work with. I have to really believe in what they're trying to create in the world. I ne- I can't work with people who I don't feel like I'm their cheerleader or that I'm supportive of their work 
even just for money. It does not, it never has worked out for me. I've had some client relationships not in the best because I've put money before that and it's been problematic. So I've learned to really trust my gut in that way when it says, oh, this person is a yes or this person is a no. And then that translate into translates into the, my personal world as well. Like when I'm meeting people and dating and things like that, of like my gut is telling me this. Um, it is also uh, taught me around like communication and um, like time management and making sure that I'm in integrity with myself, with the things I say I want to do. Right. So we always talk about being in integrity with others. But when you're an entrepreneur, just like when they teach you when you go from high school to college and there's no one to like bring, like get you to get up and all these things like you are on your own, like you want it, you want it. And it's kind of like that with entrepreneurship, like being in integrity with the things I say that I want and like really being honest when I don't show up in certain kind of ways. I totally can relate on every level for, I always say like running a business is like spiritual growth, acceleration, like every single thing will come up, survival, behavior, money stuff, worth stuff. Uh, I mean, everything, how we treat ourselves, you know, like how we treat other people, what we want, like all of these huge, big questions are going to come up and we're going to have to work our way through. And you kind of started to answer my next question. So I'm okay. loving our little like psychic <laughs> interview here. Uh, but I'm going to ask you it again, because I want to hear more about this. You seem to always be exploring how you put your values into action, into tangibility in your business and in your life, as you said, right? Being in integrity, being in right relationship with everything. How does that reflect how does that integrity, those values reflect specific ways you've decided to run your business? Um, it's a really great question. I mean, I've made a really conscious decision to not scale my business really large um, because I can't do it in a way that would be an integrity and that wouldn't be like cause that would fall into cap anti-capitalism. Like if I scale and grew it really big, I'd lose some of the uh, tangible like ethics and values that I'm able to hold on to with it just being really me. But I have a collaborator. Her name is Aja and she's been working with me for a few years now. And it's really just me and her. And so I have made like that my biggest thing of like, I'm not scaling to have a team and um, also bring in like millions of dollars. Like that is not the goal for me. Um, and also I've decided to be really clear on how I pay like the people that I work with. Like if we're collaborating on something, we're doing revenue shares and profit sharing. We are being really honest about like living wages and things like that. Can you, uh, I just want to hold, hold on yeah. to that for a minute. So what you just for people listening, if they don't understand. So basically what you're saying is if you create a project and someone else helps you a lot and it's not just your vision or it's not just your everything, you'll give them a percentage of what was made out of that. Is that correct? Correct. Yeah. So like if I'm working with someone on a long, even when I have clients that come in and hire me, we usually ha we're hiring, they're hiring me on a revenue share. Like they'll give me a base pay, but then if they're creating something really big that I've helped them uh, thought partner on produce, like it's both of us in there, like then there's a revenue share that comes from that part of the work. So what does in this context, so I love, actually, I just want to reflect something. I love that you shared you're not scaling because it's something I think about a lot um, myself. Like, I don't know if I want to, I mean, I don't think I want to scale. And for the similar reasons of what you said, um, I also am like not interested in doing business as usual, just because everyone tells you to scale and tells you to do this and do that. Um, I'm first and foremost an artist and I feel like you're really creative, like you're a writer. So I think there's something about creative people who are like, well, I don't want to be a manager or I don't, I want to like work on the things I want to work on. And I'm just wondering for you now in your life or in your business or both, what does success look like? Like what are metrics of success for you? 
I would say being able to really bring forth the things that I feel are important for people to be sitting with now, right? So I don't ever want to do something because it's trendy. I don't ever want to do something because it's easy. I want to do something because it has roots. Uh, Wait, just like, (laughs) I want, let's, you don't ever want to do something because it's trendy. You don't ever want to do something just because it's easy. You want to do things that have roots. Mm -hmm. We're going to stay there for a minute because it is a mic drop moment. (laughs) I had to repeat it. What, what is roots for you? Like, what is that? What does that feel like? Or what is that? consist of or what's an example of that I'm really intrigued by this for me it just means things that ask people to show up more to like question more to like when I'm working with people they're hiring me really to be a mirror and to reflect to them the things that they say they want even if it's not easy in their businesses right and so any offerings that I'm creating I want them to move the needle in a way that leads us to liberation more than it keeps us in this traditional mindset of like what we have been taught to believe as uh, natural, right? Like we have been taught to believe so many of these systems are natural. And so I just want to make sure anything that I'm bringing forward is rooted in liberation and asking people to really sit with like, why do we do that? Why do you do that? Like, how did we come to be? Because honestly, the only way forward and, you know, the way we're going to get liberation is to question our ideology and our perspectives and our points of view and like get curious around like, why did I start doing that? And so that's really, I think, with a, what a lot of my work really is. It's just like having people question things and see where they land. From a place of their own authenticity or their own integrity, not necessarily what they taught, they were learned in business school or what someone told them on the internet or something. So this moves into my next my <laughs> next portion. I'm loving this. Yeah. You're helping. You're making. I know you said you don't like easy, but this is so nice and easy. <laughs> Um, but what we're going to talk about next is not that easy. I literally wrote here in the next part of the interview, talk some shit about capitalism, <laughs> which I'm hoping you're okay with. Yes. Okay. So I'm going to read uh, just an excerpt from an Instagram post you made a while back. You said, we must recognize that so many of the ways that we've been taught to divine, to define ourselves are tied to capitalism and self-exploitation. Essentially, in capitalism, the more that you're willing to exploit yourself, the more you can ascend the capitalist ladder. I was hoping you could kind of share a little bit more about that. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, if we just think about the people that we give praise to are the people who are like hustling and grinding. They don't sleep, right? They have like, they don't really sleep. They don't get any relaxing time. They're not really hanging out with friends. They're just making money. They're constantly talking about business and money and all these things. And um, what we essentially have been taught is to exploit ourselves. And like this happens from grade school. It starts because schooling is a form of capitalist production, right? Like we are, we are teaching kids how to be a part and be a cog in that wheel, right? So you go to school for eight hours, you come home and you do three hours of homework. And then you have like two hours with your family and you're stressed out beginning in grade school. And so we carry that, carry that, carry that. And then we learn that our rest is in our own. Our rest is a byproduct and we are gifted rest once we are successful in making money and successful in having a good job. Or if you are a marginalize or hold a marginalized identity, you really don't, aren't supposed to get rest. Um, and so we don't even question these things. And then we hold to this status. We hold this status against each other, right? And so we look and we compare and we contrast and we're like, oh, they're not worth anything because they are not successful and they haven't done this thing. And they essentially haven't exploited themselves enough. And that's what we're really looking at. 
Yeah, as you're talking, I was thinking about what you said earlier, the the point you made about we're led to believe what we do is natural. Mm-hmm. But what we do is not natural. If you look outside, the sun rests, <laughs> like yeah. the earth rests, like there are moments where, uh, you know, rest is all part of the, the process. And we've really been trained to think that honestly, the most brutal ways of being exploitation uh, are the norm. And mm-hmm. I was hoping, could you share a little bit about how you sort of started to unravel that within yourself over the years or recently? I would say this has been a, it's been a lifelong journey that I didn't even know I was doing it, right? I just have always been someone, I've done well in jobs, but I get to a point where I start asking too many questions or pushing against too many of the traditional ways of being. And then I end up like either I have to quit or I'm going to get fired. And it's because as I look back, I really was pushing against this idea that they, people could exploit me and I should be okay with it and that I shouldn't say anything about it. And I shared on Instagram a few weeks ago, a story around um, a company that I used to work for. And I was really great at this job. I, I, because I was so great in it, I could get it done in like four hours versus the eight hours. And when I would be done, I'd be like, I want to go home because essentially I don't want you to get the extra labor from me. I'm done. Like you can pay me the four. I'm fine. And what they, the company marked that as was me being um, not a team player because I wouldn't then stay for another four hours and ask what other work needs to be done in other departments. And so slowly the energy changed. And then I was let go because I wasn't a team player. I mean, I'm trying to imagine like an anarchist in like a corporate setting, like in the cubicle being like, this is my labor. You know, you're like this, like socialist. You're like, no, I, I did my, my role. I did my job. I don't yeah. think they're going to be like, cool. Yeah. Sure. Like here's the break room or, right. you know, yeah. but yeah, yeah, but that, but that's really normalized. You know, I, I like that the competition, um, and the exploitation as, um, coined or presented as team player community, you know, I'm reading this great book, uh, right now it's called work won't love you back. Mm. And the the author is a labor journalist, Sarah Jaffe, and she talks about how all of these constructs sort of happened and how we're led to believe that um, there's so much identity stuff wrapped up in work. There's so much worth stuff, like you're a good person or you're a bad person, if you conform, if you don't, you know, and it's all just ultimately to serve the... Uh, devices of the company you know it's not actually to help you like you being exhausted after 70 hours of working isn't going to make you a better person but then of course then that dovetails in with like puritanicalism and then of course we know the basis of capitalism in our country which of course is slavery and the theft uh and genocide of indigenous peoples. And so like the bar, that's where the bar is, right? So it just takes so much to even like think outside of that. And so I'm just wondering, because I'm trying to do that in myself, Mm -hmm. it's going to be going on for the rest of my life um, um, (laughs) alongside many other things. (laughs) But uh, like for me, I'm wondering like, so for, I'll tell you what I'm working on and I'd love to hear what you're working on. Like I'd love for listeners to get maybe an idea of a a process or a practice that really what we're trying. So what I'm trying to get rid of now or trying to shift is stuff around white urgency, like stuff around, you know, feeling like other people have to be available to me. Um, and, and also I have to be available to other people thinking about, um, you know, I have a job that is not, you know, my partner is an ICU nurse. Like my -hmm. partner's job is very important. You know, I don't have a job that's very important. If my Mm -hmm. PDF is wrong or something, you know, like (laughs) nothing, nothing we're doing, nothing I'm doing is like gonna affect Mm -hmm you know, someone's, someone's heart 
pedometer or whatever. So I try to really pull back and be like, okay, where am I enacting my urgency? Um, Is this real? How am I enacting this on other people? And so also what that looks like for me and my job is really giving people breathing room, like Mm -hmm. giving someone like a two week turnaround, whereas maybe pre pandemic, It might have been a five day or you know what I mean? Like just really thinking like, hey, I'm going to like plan this out so that I'm not pushing someone to their limit. I'm not pushing myself to their limit because that's learned, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We have to have new norms, right? So like this is so so much of a conversation I have with clients around, you know, the natural versus normal. We've been we've been taught to normalize things like and view them as natural, right? So like capitalism is not natural, but it's normal. And so pushing against it means we have to look at our practices. So for me, I'm in a process now of like really looking at my practices on a day-to-day basis. Like how am I relating to people and where am I really giving my time? And where am I really, um, what am I really saying yes to? Um, and is it stuff I really want or is it stuff that I've kind of been assimilated to believe are my wants? Um, so for me, that looks like when I'm deciding, when I'm saying yes, I don't say yes to a lot of things. Right. So like, I don't, and I don't, and also I don't get asked a lot because of the work that what I talk about is so it pushes people in a certain direction. It pushes buttons, right? So like if I'm talking about capitalism and talking about patriarchy and motherhood, like it pushes people's buttons. So, but I am just really protective of my time and what I say yes to and being protective of also um, who I'm collaborating with and making sure that we're all going to be whole when we do this project or we bring it to the world. Um, Like that part is really, really important to me. I mean, that's like, again, like, let's just take a minute. (laughs) Rest to digest. (laughs) We're all going to be whole Mm -hmm. when we show up. We're Mm -hmm. all going to be able to be seen as whole, as ourselves in our collaboration or our work or our time or our exchanges together. I think that's so beautiful. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Just, it's, and now I want you to keep talking. I just was like, I needed like, again, like you're, you're just, you just say so many awesome things. Oh, thank you. Um, yeah. And being whole financially when you collaborate with people, like I just, there are so many beloveds that I'm friends with that like, like really are about the shit. Like they have, are, they're profound. And when we're bringing something into the world, like, I want to make sure they're financially taken care of and that like what we're doing is equally just for everyone involved. And so I have just this, um, yeah. So part of my practice is just like questioning all of these things and making sure that asking the question, is this normal? Is this natural? Or like, where can I do it differently? Where can we, can we do this differently? Because it's going to take us really, challenging these systems in practical ways for them to shift and change. Um, And so that's part of my work is like just interrogating that. So I wanted to read something else (laughs) because it's also from your Instagram. We all have to get a better understanding of what enough is Mm -hmm. for us because capitalist socialization and indoctrination will have us believing that all resources are infinite and that we can always have more. And in a finite world with finite natural resources, that just ain't true. But that responsibility must first be deeply held and owned by white folks who have a history, lineage, and somatic imprint that tells them that they can accumulate more and more without consequence or that the consequences don't matter. White people, especially those of you who consider yourself to be in solidarity with people of color and have class privileges, need to look at the ways in which you have more than enough and decide what that means if you're really walking your talk. That's pretty profound. <laughs> you're like, you're like, I wrote that? I wrote yeah. that. Wow. Like, that's it. <laughs> you're like, I, I'm like, still, co- you're like, I co-sign that still. You're like, yep, still stand by that. That's so, a good one. 
you know, this is something I wanted to touch upon with you because you do touch upon this publicly. And that's this thing around, you know, whiteness and power and comfortability and what that kind of can look like for folks wanting to be in solidarity for you. Is it on every level? Is it simply monetary? Is it with actions? Is it like all 360, the wholeness you talked about? And yeah, I'm just curious if you could speak a little bit more on what you brought up about enough. And like, I, there's just so much in that, uh, in that writing that you shared. Mm-hmm. Well, I think like for white folks in particular, there is this idea of like, if you're not comfortable, then like something is wrong, right? Like, so comfort is the the mechanism that the the barometer that people are white folks are like balancing things on is their comfort right and so if they're not comfortable then maybe then it's like that thing is wrong because I'm uncomfortable like anything that makes them uncomfortable is then turned out they shift it to be wrong and so I think it's important for white folks to really look at what comfort is and how they get to be comfortable Um, and their comfort is also based on the uncomfortableness of like that black and brown and indigenous folks have to live with. Right. So that's the first thing. And then the second thing is around like enough is a really big conversation because in our capitalist ways of being, even if you're not a capitalist, right. So we talk about capitalism and I think people start to think, am I a capitalist? Like, no. You're not like you don't own the means of production and all these things. You're not a capitalist in that sense. But we have capitalist ways of being and existing in the world because in order to participate, we have to believe it to be true. And so capitalism believes that there's no such thing as enough. You can have the sky is the limit. You can have whatever you want, however you want it, how much of it. And the truth is that's not true. That it just is not true. Um, And we see that in our like active natural world and our natural resources. We can see it. We have a model for it. This isn't like made up. Like we actually can see it. And so then if we can look at our natural world and be like, oh, like there isn't enough. Like we have to then look for ourselves and say, what is enough really for me? Because what happens is, especially as entrepreneurs, we are fed million dollar, billion dollar dreams every day. You can scale, you can have an offer, and you can make all this money in the world. And when you have a lot of money, then what happens is you consume more. And the consumption is is essentially what is kind of ruining the world. It's like we're consuming so many things. And I think there is a thought of like, I'm not against making money. Like, that's the thing. I'm not against making money. I think we all need to be well, but then our definition of well and enough has to change. And it has to interrogate what does that look like, right? So if we all were millionaires, won't we all be consuming more? Like, won't we all, like, what does that mean for our world? What does that actually mean? But do we all need to be millionaires? I don't know. You know, like, it it really is for me, a question of understanding, like, do I need, like, do I need more? And should there even be millionaires? Right. Like just in general, it's made up, like, you know, can't we just change it? Like, it's just, yeah. Yeah. Okay. I love that. So I guess uh, I just wanted to ask, so you do think that businesses can be anti-capitalist? I think I think businesses can have anti-capitalist practices. Um, I don't think if you are an entrepreneur, it's just you and another person, you are a capitalist business taking over the world at all. Yeah. Um, I think business is a function of capitalism, right? But the people I'm that are probably listening to this and the folks that I work with are like one to two person shows or they usually, or they have like, a a little small team. And so they're not the capitalist corporation that we really are talking about. But, but that doesn't mean we just get off. That means that 
we've all had a job, we've all worked, we've had families that work. So we all carry with us ways of capitalism inside of our businesses. And so my work is like looking at that, like how are you paying your people? What are you talking about when you're marketing? Are we using scarcity? Because that is a form of like manipulation, which leads into exploitation, like all of these links. So like being really conscious and trying to figure out how we do it differently. So we do, we don't have these practices which uphold the structures that we're trying to do away with. Yeah. And I just want to kind of chime in, like if folks listening are really excited by this, they can definitely get on Toy's mailing list. All the links will be in the show notes. You can work with Toy, join your group. You know, there's many, many ways that you, there's many resources you have to help folks who are questioning, who maybe need some guidance or need some like concrete practices. And that'll all be in the show notes because I know there's a ton of people listening being like, I want to, I need to know more. I need some help. And that is uh, who Toy works with and collaborates with. Um, So I just have two more questions. Um, The last one is, you know, I, I also, as I was combing through your Instagram in preparation for our time together, you spoke about holding the vision. And I'm wondering what holding the vision looks like or consists of for you now. Mm. Well, the vision, I have so many different visions, but the vision really for me is like a world where my sons get to feel hella safe. Mm. Right. So I have four black sons and I want them to be able to be as free as they can. So that is part of my vision always in my work in any facet is like we're moving the needle a little bit for them to be freer. Like we're moving the needle a little bit for them to be whole. Um, That is probably part of my vision. And then also like for me as just a mother for me to be freer as well. And that's why I talk about motherhood so much because it is a lifelong journey, but it's also extremely linked to capitalism and it's extremely linked to so many things. And so just wanting as much as I can to uh, change so much of these ways that we think about things so that there are more people challenging in their own personal world, in their own personal neighborhoods, in their families, in their their cities and, and states, um, so that things do change. So my vision, my vision is liberation. That's beautiful. What has been a recent healing accomplishment you've had that you're proud of? Healing accomplishment? I would say... <clears throat> for me is really getting enough rest at night um, so that I wake up feeling refreshed. So I have a full like bedtime routine now um, Let us know. <laughs> of like CBD oil, pillow spray, lavender camel, whatever it is, spray the pillow, light a candle, turn everything real low, chill for a bit, read because I'm a reader. I read all the time and so like read and then lights out and it's been really helpful to like I'm an early riser anyway so I'm up around six um but I don't I used to get up and like really want to work like I really now get up and want to water my plants and like look out the window (laughs) and like walk around the house that's really it so um I have less urgency really now I really just if it happens, if it, it happens, like, you know, I just, it's kind of just like this flow, like, let's just hang. (laughs) Sounds good to me. I love that. It has been such a pleasure, such a joy, such an honor. You are so brilliant. I know everyone is going to want to follow you. We'll put your, all of the links in the show notes, but just if you want to shout out where folks can find you. Mm-hmm. I am Toy Marie in all the places. So Instagram, you can find me at Toy Marie, and my website is toymarie.com. Beautiful. Thanks again. Thank you. Okay. So before we pull some cards for you, I just checked in to see if there were any messages 
for you in particular in this moment. And the message was about love. Mm. (laughs) And the message was like, it was sort of like, well, to let Toy know, yes, like, yes, love is going to show up. Yes, there's going to be a new love. And the words that kept like really coming in strong was showing up. So I like asked a little bit about that. And they said two things. They said, number one, there's something in the way you're going to be encouraged to show up uh, for whoever is here or on the way or whatever that is a little bit different than maybe like they were kind of showing me that you might be a little bit um, naturally a bit more guarded, Hmm. no judgment, just like they were just kind of showing I'm guarded. So, but they were showing me that and they were saying that in for this particular person, it's important that you show them like, I know this sounds so basic and corny and vague, but like to show them who you are, the core parts of yourself sooner rather than later. The Mm. second thing they said about this person is this is someone who is going to show up, meaning wait and see that they will show up again and again. And the word and it and it might be subtle. And the other word they used was slow burn. Like, so it might be sort of like, I don't, I have no idea. I didn't ask more, but like, maybe they don't live in the same town or maybe there's a different schedule or maybe it's just sort of a slower paced kind of thing. But they said, it's going to be different. I don't know what your, the majority of your relationships were like, but it seemed like maybe there was some intensity and there was some like faster kind of movement. And they were like, this is going to feel different. So to have you be aware that different doesn't mean bad. Just because maybe it's just a little tickle of a butterfly instead of a huge beating heart, like, oh my gosh, just, they said, just stay with it. Okay. That's what they had. Um, And I want to know what questions do you have for the cards today? Do you have a question? Oh my gosh. That was a lot, Sarah. (laughs) You're like, like, can you just give me like a minute? Oh, wow. Um, I don't know if I have a question in particular that, I mean, I always ask about love because it's interesting. Love is always a question that I ask when I have readings or anything like that. Business stuff, all that stuff feels fine for me. It's the love stuff that I'm always like, this is the part of my life that's wonky. So, Well, they kind of told, we kind of shared some stuff already. So what question do you want to go into for a little bit? Um... I guess I would want to know more about like love in the next year. Like how does love, um, what maybe do I need to do to have love show up in the way that I need it? (sighs) Okay. I got chills. So you got three really, really powerful cards and I'm going to talk a little bit about them. I'm sure you know all about them um, too and have your own kind of, this is really interesting when I'm looking at them. So I'm just going to really be traditional old school tarot reader and be like, okay, number one, you definitely, it appears from these cards that you are ready for something really long-term you're ready. And so then that means of course, the person has to be ready for something long-term, right? So that's the need. I don't know if that's true, but it feels like it looking at these cards. Why? Well, number one, you got the chariot. Mm -hmm. Look at that little cutie coming your way. (laughs) Number two, you got the empress. Mm. Number three, you got the 10 of, of pentacles the 10 of discs. Mm. So like the first thing is it is going to be different because the chariot is all about transformation and about leaving the familiar and about going someplace different. It's interesting that there was a little inkling in the beginning before looking at the cards about travel. It was sort of like, Oh, maybe that person lives in a different place or maybe this person has like travels for their job or there's some sort of sense of movement. And I'm also wondering if it really is time to call in someone who's really ready to travel with you, because maybe 
previously you dated folks who weren't into changing and growing and molting and shedding and um, you know, they, maybe they wanted something that felt like a flat line, which isn't bad, but it's clearly not what you're interested in right now with these cards. So, you know, the chariot is, um, is about movement and where you're going and where you'd like to go and really being conscious. I think that this person, I, I almost feel like the first questions you should be asking yourself is like, is this person into personal development? Have they like, where have they come from? And where are they now? You know, like, what is the distance between that? You know, where do they want to go? Are they, are they forward facing? Are they future facing as much as they are in the present? How do they handle change? You know, does that excite them? Um, how do you handle change? <laughs> you know, cause that's yeah. like, a, that's like this thing, like you're ready to shed something. You're ready to let go. Like if the chariot is you, you are ready to take the most important things that you need from what you've learned in this cycle, because you are coming out of a cycle. That's always usually what the chariot is about. And then here's the empress. You know, the empress is so much about it's Venus. It's ruled by Taurus and Libra. It's very Venusian. It's obviously about love. It's obviously about attracting love. And I can't help but look at these two cards together the person does have to show up and come to you because the empress is in her garden already. The empress doesn't, the empress isn't really looking to be super disturbed. The empress is like, I know what I have. I want what I have. I'm enjoying what I have. I want someone who's going to add to this and help me grow. You know, I almost feel like the word that came in was like, it was almost like before maybe you were in relationships where you were building them. And now like you're really ready for someone to help support your growth and they have to know that's non-negotiable. And the Empress also that I want to say about the Empress, if we're talking about love, the Empress generally attracts and sits back. They're not, you know, overextending because the Empress ultimately is about the seasons and rhythms and patterns of life, right? When to, when to rest, when to push, so on and so forth. So I really am sort of thinking like, this is someone who is going to want to create a garden with you, you know, um, and understand how important your garden is to you and your growth cycles are to you. And they're going to be, you know, along for that ride. So I also think again, centering that, you know, like really centering that growth, really putting up front, like I'm changing all the time. Like I am a different person every year. Mm -hmm. How are you going to get on board with that? Who were you a year ago? Like Mm -hmm. show me about what you've learned, you know? And if you're asking about like what you need, I really think with this 10 of discs, we see this story around stability and we Mm -hmm. see this story around, you know, someone who wants to create a legacy in terms of family, in terms of, you know, what you're passing on in terms of lineage, someone who's really strong in their lineage and their family, and who wants to do that with you, you know, the other thing too, is that a lot of times the 10 of pentacles can be about a coming home, and making a home, you know, and what that feels like, and what that looks like. And these cards look like if I were to tell a story about these cards is like, you have been coming home so that you now know what that feels like Mm -hmm. and nothing can take that from you. So you'll know really soon if someone feels like home, if -hmm. someone wants to support that feeling, there's this hard oneness that is really transforming into blossoming and growth that Mm -hmm. I also see, you know, with, with these cards. So I also think is like, don't be afraid to grow and don't be afraid to be the empress Mm -hmm. to be like, I have my little vampire or whatever you want to call it. (laughs) Like I have this, this gift of my hard won self love Mm -hmm. and self respect. And you get to help me grow that. And I don't have to be like at the mercy of your whims or your anxieties or your insecurities. Mm -hmm. Does this all make sense? Perfect sense. I mean, it's exciting because I got chills because the first thing they told me was like, we got to share this message about love. And it just shows that you're really ready for 
a different kind of love, a new kind of love, and you'll know it when it comes in. And also though, it might be really different. Mm -hmm. Like Mm -hmm. maybe you're like, wait, they want to like build a family with me or they want to like move in. Mm -hmm. Like that might be really, um, activating, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know? So just sort of like, remember that as you like pace yourself, like as you, uh, kind of open. Okay. Does that all make sense? That all is, that makes perfect sense. Okay. That's it. Was your mind blown? Are you questioning everything? Are you excited to do things differently? I really, really hope so. And I really hope that you give Toy a follow, check out her work, contact her about working with her if everything resonated with you, which I'm sure it did. I am wishing you the gentlest, the softest entry into June, my dears, and I will be back next week. Moonbeaming is brought to you by The Moon Studio. It is created and hosted by me, Sarah Faith Godestiner. It is edited by the incredible Caitlin George Parker. Additional support is by Stella Hartman. Music is by Will Owen and myself. If you like this podcast, you can support us by going to Patreon backslash The Moon Studio and becoming a patron. You can give this podcast five stars wherever you listen and also subscribe. We'd love it if you could let one or two or three or four or more friends know about us and we accept all good vibes. Thanks so much for supporting us. Witches on planet Earth, not flying up to Mars. There is no planet B. There's a